Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. I'd like to do a video on Immanuel Kant. I've been endlessly badgered by uh, some academics who think that um, if I say Immanuel Kant is at the base of our culture or that his philosophy is bad or something, they will not accept what I say if I'm quoting somebody. I have to go right to Kant myself. I can't quote anything anybody says about Kant. I can't quote objectivists on Kant. Anything I say about Kant that comes from somebody else is not valid. I have to say it myself. It has to come from me in order for them to listen to it. I mean, that's what their argument implies. They don't even say that I'm wrong or anything. They just say, you know, explain yourself more or whatever. And they don't want an explanation, because the explanations, I mean, the explanation's available, you can get it. They don't want an explanation. They want to be rapidly skeptical. They just want to put a question mark in the way, every step of the way, so you can never get anywhere. That's how they get their paychecks. Well, let's read a little bit about Immanuel Kant from the lexicon. Now. Randy Heltzerman goes on and on saying how he's never heard objectivists justify their fear of Kant and their hatred for him. Um, so what's the big deal and why is Kant such a big deal and stuff? Well, if you haven't heard any more about it than that, then that's because you haven't looked at all. Because the objectivists have all kinds of literature available on Kant. There's just little blurbs here. Um, and it goes for eight pages, just little blurbs out of different books and different essays and stuff. The first quote, on every fundamental issue, Kant's philosophy is the exact opposite of objectivism. That is from a brief summary, The Objectivist Ethics, September 1971. Um, the next quote will be from For the New Intellectual. This is page 31 on For the New Intellectual. The man who closed the door of philosophy to reason was Immanuel Kant. Kant's expressly stated purpose was to save the morality of self-abnegation and self-sacrifice. He stated it openly. That's what he was trying to do. To save the morality of self-abnegation and self-sacrifice. He knew that it could not survive without a mystical base. And what it had to be saved from was reason. So he had to save faith from science, or mysticism had to be saved from logic. Um, now, in her book uh, for the New Intellectual, Ayn Rand talks about there's the Attila, Attila the Hun, and there's the witch doctor. Those are the two types of groups there are in the world. Attila wants to use a club on you, and the witch doctor wants to scare the hell out of you with a spell. But neither of them want to be rational. So there's the people who use physical force, and there's the people who use uh, mental falseness. Okay? One of them wants to control your body with a club. The other wants to control your mind with a religion. But they both want to control you, and neither one of them want to be rational. Now, that's the dichotomy Ayn Rand talks about in For the New Intellectual. So we'll be able to make sense of this quote here. Attila's share of Kant's universe includes this earth, physical reality, man's senses, perceptions, reason, and science, all of it labeled the phenomenal world. You've certainly heard of Immanuel Kant's noumenal and phenomenal. So the phenomenal world consists of the earth, physical reality, man's senses, perceptions, reason, and science. That's Attila's share. That's the physical bit. The witch doctor's share of the universe uh, is another higher reality, which Immanuel Kant labeled the noumenal world, and a special manifestation labeled the categorical imperative, which dictates to man the rules of morality and which makes itself known by means of a feeling, as a special sense of duty. A feeling as a special sense of duty. That's how the categorical imperative makes itself known. The phenomenal world, said Kant, is not real. Where did he get his information? Well, that's fine. 
Reality, as perceived by man's mind, is a distortion, according to Immanuel Kant. The distorting mechanism is man's conceptual faculty. Man's basic concepts, such as time, space, and existence, are not derived from experience or from reality. We do not get our ideas from experience or from reality. They come from automatic, an automatic system of filters in his consciousness, labeled categories or forms of perception, as Kant put them. Now, these categories or forms of perception impose their own design on a man's perception of the external world and make him incapable of perceiving it in any manner other than the one in which he does perceive it. This proves, said Immanuel Kant, that man's concepts are only a delusion. And not just that, but a collective delusion, which no one has the power to escape. We can't even get out of it. It's not just a delusion on my part, but we're all together making this crap up. And there's no way to, to see out the other side. How did Kant see out the other side? Good question. He never answers it. Thus, reason and science are limited, said Kant. They're limited to the reality we create with our senses. They're valid only as long as they deal with this world, with uh, a permanent, predetermined, collective delusion. And thus, the criterion of reason's validity was switched from the objective to the collective. They used to say, what's rational is what makes sense in reality. Then it becomes what's rational or real is what the people believe. And you have to go to the people and get their idea, the masses and the mobs, and get their idea or their interpretation. And that goes. Uh, but they are impotent to deal with the fundamental metaphysical issues of existence, which belong to the noumenal world. The noumenal world is unknowable. It is the world of real, reality, superior truths and things in themselves or things as they are which means things as they are not perceived by men now that's a very interesting clear distinction right there um, Kant's noumenal world the, no the world of actual reality that we cannot get to is defined its nature is the fact that we don't perceive it. Everything we perceive is not part of the noumenal world. All of what we call reality is the phenomenal world. The noumenal world is totally and completely inaccessible to us. Completely. You can't even get there with reason or rationality or logic. Some of you may be wondering how Immanuel Kant got there, and that's objectivism's big beef with him is that he's arbitrary and just pulls his system out of his ear and everybody just follows along. Now we're going to skip uh, down a little bit here. The entire apparatus of Kant's system, like a hippopotamus engaged in belly dancing, goes through its gyrations while resting on a single point. That man's knowledge is not valid because his consciousness possesses an identity. Man's consciousness has a specific nature. We see through our senses. So, because of that fact, we don't know anything. That's Kant's whole basis, is to say, our senses shape reality. Therefore, we don't know the real reality. I think that's a pretty good summation of it, a hippopotamus engaged in belly dancing. It's a pretty funny visual there. Skipping down a little further, this quote from Faith and Force, the destroyers of the modern world in Philosophy Who Needs It. Quote, a straw man is an odd metaphor to apply to such an enormous, cumbersome, ponderous construction as Kant's system of epistemology. Nevertheless, a straw man is what it is, or was. And the doubts, the uncertainty, the skepticism that followed, skepticism about man's ability ever to know anything, were not, in fact, applicable to human consciousness, because it was not a human consciousness that Kant's robot represented. 